Okay. The market is failing. And I'm not talking about the stock market or the market for any good or service in particular, but I'm talking about the entire idea of the market system as a whole. Now, as an economics professor, that's not an entirely painless thing for me to admit, uh, but it's important to understand so that we can get to the solution. And the market actually fails because it works so well. The market is very efficient and very reliable, and that reliability is where it lets us down as consumers. And by letting us down as consumers, it lets down our communities. It fails us as people in a community. Now, the entire idea of the market based system is based upon you know supply and demand and that there are some producers who will make some stuff and then we as consumers will buy this stuff and if we don't like it we won't buy it and that stuff will just go away where the failure comes in is based on the assumption that com that consumers are going to effectively communicate the stuff we want to producers and they'll listen it ignores a very real thing that we all need to keep in mind, and that is that consumers will consume anything so long as they're given the opportunity. That's why we're called consumers. We consume, that's what we do. Now, you might not believe this failure, you know, you might believe in the market system and, and uh, it's gonna sort itself out, but as an example of how it failed and how one industry overcame this failure, I want to talk about what I do uh, on a more day-to-day -day basis, uh, which is in economics, it's uh, the beer business. Now beer means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. For about half of the United States, it usually means some Anheuser-Busch product. Uh, for another 30% of the United States, it usually means some Miller Coors product. But for somebody in Germany, it might mean a Moss or a liter Stein of Dunkelweitz at the neighborhood, neighborhood brewery, wherever that happens to be. If you live in that neighborhood, that's the brewery you go to. If you're one of the indigenous peoples of Peru, it might mean a drink called chicha, which is made by uh, Peruvian ladies who chew on corn and then spit the corn into a mash because their saliva contains enzymes which start the, start the conversion of starch to sugar, which we need in the fermentation process. If you're one of the indigenous peoples of Portland, uh, <laughs> beer probably means whatever's closest and either gets the least amount of foam or maybe the most amount of foam in your beard, and that's what you'd like to drink. Uh, for me today, beer means uh, a prickly pear wild ale that we aged in wine barrels for eight months, and it has this funky color, and uh, you, know, you might have thought I was walking up here with Kool-Aid, but yes, this is beer. Cheers. <laughs> now, the reason I point all that out is not really just to have an excuse to drink some beer, because uh, I really don't need one. It's to point out that variety is important, and we know this as consumers. We, we value variety. But variety wasn't always there in the beer industry. After Prohibition, or before Prohibition, there was 1,500 breweries operating in the United States. Immediately after Prohibition, 750. In 1980, there was only 100 operating breweries in the United States, and they were all making pretty much the same beer, American light lager. It's yellow, it's fizzy, it has very little odor or taste, uh, but it gets you drunk if you drink enough of it. But, so, so this happened, uh, and we had this one beer. How did this happen? Well, this happened because the market works. It works exactly the way we expect it to. There were a, a, two couple important trends happened. Uh, aside from the commoditization of the product we call beer, there was a shift in consumer preferences from draft product, which you would get on tap at a bar, to package product. So, uh, you know, cans, bottles, et cetera. Uh, this requires, along with the commoditization, both these things uh, together provided a great incentive for companies to strive to achieve economies of scale. 
the basic idea that if we produce more of something, the average cost of that thing will be lower, and thus we can increase our profits. So what we had was a bunch of businesses who now, instead of making 10 different brands that totaled maybe 1 million barrels of production a year, now we can make one brand that totals 1 million barrels of beer in a year, economies of scale. We capture economies of scale, our packaging costs goes down. So the astute business manager is gonna go after those economies of scale. But unfortunately what happened then is we end up with one type of beer that really, uh, it's questionable how good that type of beer really is. If I told you that there was one, there was a thing called hamburger and that it was defined by the 59 cent hamburger at McDonald's and that's what a hamburger is and there's no other type of hamburger, how many of you are gonna love hamburgers? Probably not a lot of you. Uh, or if wine is just white Zinfandel that comes out of a box, that's wine, right? There's no other wine. That doesn't work. You've never heard anyone say, you know, it, that they don't like variety. You've never heard anyone sit in their house say, you know what, make this house better if it looked like all the other houses in my neighborhood. <laughs> we like variety. And yet, the market, behaving exactly as we expected it to, took away all of that variety. And it failed us as consumers. At the end of the day, products are about the people who consume them, no? Uh, without people to consume them, then what are they for? They're not job creators, they're for consumers. So the market failed us, and it gave us a product that we don't really want. But then something amazing happened around 1980, and that was the birth of the craft brewer. Small, independent breweries who don't even begin to scratch the surface of economies of scale and are relatively and comparatively hugely cost inefficient. So cost inefficient that we're talking about the difference between a $10 12 pack of Bud Light or a $10 six pack of uh, real ale, uh, uh, Lost Gold IPA, which I bought a six pack of last night. Huge cost disadvantages the craft brewers have. But what they do have working for them is economies of authenticity. We, and that's what drove them to exist in the first place. These pioneers of the craft brewing movement going to the grocery store realizing, wow, I don't like any of these beers. They'll have different packaging, but they all taste exactly the same. I'm going to make something else. What the craft brewers taught us is that we can eschew economies of scale in favor of economies of authenticity. And it's worked, and they're killing it. Craft brewers are up big over the last five years, up 40%. Meanwhile, Budweiser, the self-proclaimed great American lager, in five years is down 30%. Bud Select, a cool, hit brand that comes with a sleek black label and has commercials that make you think if you drink it, you'll be popular, uh, is down 80% in five years. The big brewers are losing their, their market, and they're trying some way, somehow, to hold on to it any way they can. So much so that they're making products that they're even ashamed to put their name on. If you don't believe me, Go to your grocery store aisle later and tell me if you can figure out who makes Blue Moon. Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's either Bud or Miller Coors. Uh, so 50-50 shot when you guess. What happened though, that, so these craft brewers eschewed economies of scale, says we're gonna make what we want, an authentic product, and it's worked. People will pay for quality stuff. What we've learned and what we can learn from the craft brewer is that economies of scale presents a traditional prisoner's dilemma, where the prisoner's dilemma is, okay, two, two people are arrested, cops are questioning them, they present them the opportunity, hey, rat out your partner, you'll get a lower prison sense, sentence. What ends up happening is they both out, rat out each other, and they end up with more lengthy sentences than they otherwise would have if they both would have just kept their mouth shut. The prisoner's dilemma is that when we follow the incentive that seems like it is the optimal one, 
we end up with a suboptimal solution. And when we strive for economies of scale, we suboptimize our communities. What we need is entrepreneurs who can eschew those economies of scale and capture those economies of authenticity. The carrot is dangling, however, always for those economies of scale. Any business person say, you know, if I can make this much more volume, there's that next price break. If I can do this much more, my costs are gonna go down, my profits are gonna increase. But we have to say no, because when we follow economies of scale, what we end up happening is, next thing you know, I wake up one day and I own 47 Subway franchises. Now, Subway makes a good sandwich, but our communities don't need another Subway. We don't need another McDonald's. We don't need another Arby's. We don't even need another Freetail Brewing Company. What we need is whatever the entrepreneur is passionate about. And we need them to eschew economies of scale for the economies of authenticity. Because as we found, the trap, the breaking away from the prisoner's dilemma, will actually lead us to the optimal solution, not only for the entrepreneur, greater profits in the long run, like the craft brewer, but also better communities. We have a community now with local, locally owned, independent businesses with character lining our streets, rather than a series of chain restaurants. So the, the solution to a market failure is a market-based approach. You know, I'm certainly not willing to, or ready to abandon the market, the theory of the market. Uh, as an economist, I've just been indoctrinated in the whole thing, and that's uh, the, the cross I have to bear for my entire life. But it's not a, a matter of we need regulation or anything like that. We just need people who are willing to stand up for better ideas. And the solution is simple. If you want better businesses and better communities, just do it. Be a better business. Make a better product. And it doesn't stop there. The entrepreneur has a huge amount of onus on them, but we need our developers to take some of that onus on them as well. And say, yes, I know you're tempted to build a shopping center the way all shopping centers are built. You have a bank on the hard corner and a large box retailer in the back, and then you have a fast casual, and then you have a drive through up on the frontage, and everything else just fits in, you know, where it is. These aren't communities. Those are, those are consumer traps. It's a trap to get you in there and lock you in. And I say this as somebody who's living depends on being in one of these consumer traps. But I can recognize it for what it is. We need developers who are going to ignore that short run prisoner's dilemma trap and strive to build a better center. And then lastly, we need leaders who are going to see the vision for our better communities and, and structure their incentive programs to recognize that. Yes, it might seem like a chain restaurant or a big national concern might bring a few more jobs in the short run, but what it's gonna do in the long run is devastate a community. We don't need a community center, the centerpiece of our city, to have a chain steakhouse, a chain wings place, a chain uh, you know, jungle-themed cafe. <laughs> this is, that's not a community centerpiece. That's a strip mall on a river. <laughs> and it doesn't do any good. And our leaders not need to think inside the old school box of incentives have to be monetary or incentives have to be about, you know, providing grants or any of those things. We can find more cost effective solutions to incentives. We can find solutions that are about supporting our local businesses and not about putting lipstick on a pig to quote uh, my favorite politician to make fun of and promote and pimping ourselves on a B-list reality TV show. Unnecessary, invest in our communities and we'll have better communities, we'll have better businesses and, uh, and we'll go from there. So in conclusion, entrepreneurs, it's on you. Avoid the trap, build a better business. Developers, 
Give that business a chance. Embrace the business who has that rebelliousness of the craft brewer. They're gonna make your center or your development better in the long run. And then city leaders, embrace those, those entrepreneurs as well who have that rebelliousness because they're the ones who's gonna make your city better. People wanna live where, where there's great stuff to do. And that's better businesses all around. So be better. Thank you.